Section 1 of Dear Mabel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Conkle. Dear Mabel, Love Letters of a Rookie by Edward Streeter. Dear Mabel, I guess you thought I was dead. You'll never know how near you was to write. We got the tents up at last, though, so I got a minute to write. I guess they chose these camps by mail order. The only place they're flat is on the map. Where our tents is would make a good place for a Rocky Mountain goat if he didn't break his neck. The first day the captain came out and says, Pitch your tents here. Then he went to look for someone else quick before anybody could ask him how. I wish I was a captain. I guess he thought we were Alpine chasers, eh, Mabel? But you probably don't know what those are. Honest, Mabel, if I'd put in the work I'd done last week on the Panama Canal, it would have been working long before it was. Of course, there was a lot of fellows there with me, but it seemed like all they did was stand around and hand me shovels when I wore them out. The captain appreciates me, though. The other day he watched me work a while, and then he says, Smith, he calls me Smith now, we've got very friendly since I've been nice to him. I noticed none of the other fellows had much to say to him. I kind of felt sorry for him. He's a human being, even if he is a Captain Mabel. So every time I saw him, I used to stop him and talk to him. Democratic. That's me all over, Mabel. Smith, he says, if they was all like you round here, war would be hell. No joke. By which he meant that we would make it hot for the Boshes. I've been feeling awful sorry for you, Mabel. What with missing me and your father's liver gone back on him again, things must have been awful lonesome for you. It isn't as if you was a girl what had a lot of fellows hanging around all the time. Not that you couldn't have them, Mabel. But you don't, and there's no use making no bones about it. If it hadn't been for me, I guess things would have been pretty stupid, though I don't begrudge you a cent. You know how I am with my money. I guess you ought to know anyway, Aunt Mabel. Never talk of money matters in connection with a woman. That's me all over. Now I got started and found a fountain pen at the YMCA, giving away paper like it does, I'm going to write you regular. They say they are going to charge three cents for a letter pretty soon. That ain't going to stop me, though, Mabel. There ain't no power in heaven or earth, as the poets say, as can come between you and me, Mabel. You might send a few three-cent stamps when you write. That is, if your father's able to work yet. And willin', I should add. Of course it ain't nothing to me, but I'd keep these letters what you get from me as a record of the war. Some day you can read them to your grandchildren and say, Your grandfather Bill did all these things. Ain't I the worst, Mabel? Serious, though, I haven't found none so far what has thought of doing this except the newspapers. I guess I'll get a lot of inside stuff that they'll never see. So this may be the only one of its kind, but it doesn't matter to me what you do with them, Mabel. Later I'll tell you all about everything, but I guess you won't understand much because it's technical. Lots of fellows are getting knitted things and candy and stuff right along. Don't pay no attention to that, though, or... Take it for a hint, cause it ain't. I just say it as a matter of record. Independent, if nothing. That's me all over. Yours till the war ends, Bill. Dear Mabel, Having nothing better to do, I take up my pen to write. We have been here now three weeks. As far as I'm concerned, I'm all ready to go. I told the captain that I was ready any time. He said yes, but that we'd have to wait for the slow ones, cause they was all going together. I says was I to go out to drill with the rest. He says yes, more for the example than anything else. It's kind of maddening to be hanging around here when I might be over there helping the Sammies put a stop to this thing. In the meantime, I've been doing some guard duty. Seems like I've been doing it every night, but I know what they're up against and I don't say nothing. Guard duty is something like extemporaneous speaking. You got to know everything you're going to say before you start. It's very technical. For instance, you walk a post, but there ain't no post. And you mount guard, but you don't really mount nothing. And you turn out the guard, but you don't really turn them out. They come out themselves. Just the other night, I was walking along thinking of you, Mabel, and my feet, which was hurting. It made me awful lonesome. An officer come up, and he says, Why don't you draw your pistol when you hear someone coming? And I says, I don't wait till the sheep is stole. I drew it this afternoon from the supply sergeant. And I showed it to him, tucked inside my shirt, where none could get it away from me without some tussle. You bet, Mabel. But it seems that you gotta keep on drawing it all the time. Then later I hear footsteps. I was expecting the relief, so I was right on the job. And a man come up, and I poked my pistol right in his face and says, Halt! Who goes there? And he says, Officer of the Day. And being disappointed as who wouldn't be, I says, Oh, hell, I thought it was the relief. And he objected to that. 
the relief mabel but what's the use you want to understand it there's some mistake up north mabel about the way we're built mabel it's kind of depressing to think that you could forget about us so quick everyone's getting sweaters without sleeves and gloves without fingers we still got everything we started with mabel why not socks without feet and pants without legs if you're making these things for after the war i think you're anticipating a little besides it's depressing for the fellows to be reminded all the time it's like giving a fellow a life membership to the old soldier's home to cheer him up when he sails i was saying the other day that if the fellows at washington ever get on to this they'll be issuing soulless shoes and shirtless sleeves it's getting awful cold no wonder this is a healthy place all the germs is froze i guess their idea of the hardening process is to freeze a fellow stiff captain said the other day we are getting intensive training that's all right but i'd kind of like to see those steam heated barracks you've read about those fellows that go swimming in the ice in winter i guess they'd like our shower baths they say cleanliness is next to godliness mabel i say it's next to impossible i started this letter almost a week ago i just found it in my baking can they call it a baking can but it's too small to bake nothing i keep my soap in it i got some news for you the regiment is to be dismantled the captain called me over this morning and asked me where i'd like to be transferred i said home if it was the same to him so they're going to send me to the artillery this is very dangerous and useful limb of the service mabel i don't know my address just write me care of the general i got the red muffler that your mother sent me give her my love just the same yours relentlessly bill dear mabel i haven't wrote for some time i had such sore feet lately when they broke up our regiment and sent me over to the artillery i thought i was going to quit using my feet that was just another rumor thanks for the box of stuff you sent me i guess the brakeman must have used it for a chair all the way it was pretty well bailed but that don't matter and thanks for the fudge too that was fudge wasn't it mabel and the socks they don't fit but i can use them for something a good soldier never throws nothing away and thank your mother for the half pair of gloves she sent me i put them away maybe sometime she'll get a chance to knit the other half or if i ever get all my fingers shot off they'll come in very handy the artillery is a little different from the infantry they make us work harder at least there's more work on the schedule i know now what they mean when they say the artillery is active on the western front they got a drill over here called the standing gun drill the name's misleading i guess it was invented by a troop of jap acrobatics they make you get up and sit on the gun before you can get settled comfortable they make you get down again it looks like they didn't know just what they did want you to do i don't like the sergeant i don't like any sergeant but this one particular the first day out be kept saying prepare to mount and then mount finally i went to him and told him that as far as i was concerned he could cut that stuff for i was always prepared to do what i was told even though it was the middle of the night he said fine then i was probably prepared to scrub pans all day sunday I don't care much for horses. I think they feels the same way about me. Most of them are so big that the only thing they're good for is the view of the camp you get when you climb up. They are what they call horse de combat in French. My horse died the other day. I guess it wasn't much effort for him. If it had been, he wouldn't have done it. They got a book they call Drill Regulations, Field and Light. That's about as sensible as it is all the way through. Francis, they say that when the command fraction is given, one man jumps for the wheel and another springs for the trail and another leaps for the muzzle i guess the fellow that wrote the regulations thought we was a bunch of grasshoppers well i've got to quit now and write a bunch of other girls thanks again for the box although it was busted that it wasn't much good but that don't matter yours till you hear otherwise bill end of section one section two of dear mabel this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dear Mabel by Edward Streeter Section 2 Dear Mabel, Today's Thanksgiving. I'm thankful things ain't no worse, though Max Glucose, what lives on the next cot, says they couldn't be. Cheery and bright to the last. That's me all over, Mabel. Every man gets a teen ounces of turkey on Thanksgiving. All to himself, Mabel. The sergeant says the committee on hay and beans on Washington decides that. Mine's inside. I'm most a fool for expression, as the poets say. 
We had a great dinner. Soup and turkey, dressing, cranberry sauce, and pie and smashed potatoes. All in one plate. I wish you could have heard how the fellows enjoyed it, Mabel. I know now why they call the turkeys gobblers. Thanksgiving is a holiday. All a fellow has to do on a holiday in the artillery is to feed the horses and give them a drink and smooth them out and take them for a walk and then feed them and smooth them out and feed them and give them a drink. It makes a fellow feel like giving back a dollar out of his pay at the end of the month. The horses has the softest of anyone, Mabel. They don't even have to get up for breakfast in the morning. We bring it to them in a little bag filled with cereal. You tie this on their face. I guess they ain't never been fed before the war broke out. When they see you coming, they start jumping around like starving sailors. I don't guess they like cereal. I wouldn't either three times a day. I thought they'd give them something different Thanksgiving, but not a chance. They're always hoping it'll be something else, I guess. When they see the same old thing, they get sore and try to step on your feet. The sergeants stand way back and say, Go on in, they won't hurt you. And then when they land on your corn, they say, That's too bad, you didn't do it right. I don't like sergeants any better than horses. And I don't know as I'm going to like the captain much better either. The other day I got laughing while I was standing in line, just laughing to myself, not disturbing nobody. The captain turns around and says, Smith, are you laughing at me? I says, No, sir. And he says, Well, what else was there to laugh at? That's the kind of fellow he is. I didn't sass him back or nothing, Mabel. Just looked at him and made him feel cheap. I saw him again in the afternoon. Of course, I didn't salute. He says, What do you mean by not saluting? I told him I thought he was mad. I'm glad I'm not his wife, Mabel. You never know how to take a fellow like that. If I hadn't known they needed me, I'd have given him two weeks' notice on the spot. Duty before pleasure, though. That's me all over. We took the guns out to drill the other day, and the captain was talking about indirect firing. That's the way he is. Nothing straightforward about him. I asked the sergeant about it. He said indirect firing was where you shoot at one thing and aimed at another. I hate to butt in, Mabel, but it didn't seem right. I says I seen the Indian girl in the circus suit the spots out of a card over her shoulder, but wouldn't it be more sensible to cut out the trick stuff till we was more used to the thing? You can't argue with sergeants, though. Day after tomorrow's inspection. They do it every Saturday. That's another thing I'm thankful for. There's only one Saturday a week. We pull everything out and pile it on our cots, then the captain and the sergeant comes in. Every time it's the same, he says, That's very dirty, Smith. Where's your other shirt? And I say, I ain't got none, sir. And he says, Sergeant, make a note of that. And then the sergeant writes something in a little book. Next time, just the same. The captain says, where's my shirt? And the sergeant makes a note. I guess there's something in the drill regulations which makes him say that, because I ain't got no other shirt yet. Well, Mabel, I'm getting hungry again now. Guess I'll have to stop and buy a couple of pies. We don't get nothing to eat for an hour yet. Yours till the ice cracks in the pail. Bill. P.S. I had to borrow a stamp for this letter. I went downtown yesterday and spent my last cent on a money belt. It's a good one, though. Dear Mabel, Raining today. No drill, so I'm going to write you. If I don't get no exercise, I go all to pieces. I'm back from the artillery into the infantry. Captain and I had different ideas about renting thing. One of us had to leave. He'd been there the longest. I left. Hot-headed. That's me all over, Mabel. We're doing bayonet drill now. I can't say nothing about it. It's not for women's ears. We have one place where we hit the hun in the nose and rip all the decorations off in his uniform in one stroke. Then there's another one where you give him a shave and a round hair cut and end by knocking his hat over his eyes. And the whipper zip come over with a lot of bums and do the dirty work. I and the rest of the fellows go ahead and take another trench. I haven't been able to find out yet where we take it. It's all worked out scientific. The fellow who doped it out had some bean. The principle of the thing is to get the other fellow and not let him get you. If the alley's bad doped out some scheme like this, the war would have been over now. There wouldn't have been no Huns left. It takes us Uncle Sammy's, eh, Mabel? They're getting up to thrift campaign now, Mabel. First they sell us enough Liberty Bonds to buy our brand new army and let us go home. Then they cram a lot of insurance at you what won't never do you no good after you're killed. Then I guess they found that someone still had a couple of dollars left so they made us send that back home. Now they're getting up a thrift campaign, Mabel. They don't want us to spend our money foolish so as we can buy the senior building or a fort or something like that when the war is over. Someone say that we was the highest paid army in the world. Besides, all this money we get our bed and board. I guess they don't know that in the army, bed and board mean the same thing. Eh, Mabel? Still the same old Bill. They're always inspecting us. I feel like a piece of prize beef. They never inspect a man all the way through. Guess the inspectors get paid by the day during the duration of the inspection. 
One day it's our teeth, and another our heart, and another our lungs. The other day we was all lined up in the company straight, and the sergeant says, Inspection arms. I lays down my gun and rolls up my sleeves, just to show you how technical the army is. He didn't want to see my arms at all but my gun. How's a fellow going to tell, Mabel? I went up for thirds at breakfast the other morning, as usual the cook said, You seem to like coffee. Right away, without stopping to think or nothing, I says back, Yes, that's the reason I'm willing to drink so much hot water to get some. Eh, hey, Mabel? Went to a dance the other night and met some swell girls. I made them all laugh. I says, I guess I got the instincts of a soldier, all right. The minute I smell powder, I'm right on my toes. I haven't been very well lately. I guess I'll cut out eating at meals. It spoils my appetite for the rest of the day. I know you'll be glad to know my feet ain't hurtin' so much. Remember me to the hired girl and your mother. Yours through the winter. Bill. Chair Mabel. That's French. I didn't expect you to know what it means, though. The YMCA are learning me French now. I only had three lessons so far, but I can talk it pretty good. You know how quick I am at picking up any kind of trick stuff like that. The only difference between French and English is that they're pretty near alike, but the French don't pronounce their words right. When I use French words, I'll underline them. That'll give you some idea of the language. When we get voila, as the French say, for over there, it'll come handy to be able to sit down and have a dozy doze with them poilus. That means chew the rag in English. A poilus, Mabel, is a French peasant girl, and they say that they are very belle. Now don't mispronounce things and get sore till you know. You pronounce that like bell and push button. It means good lookers. They're crazy about us fellows. They call us Sammies. They named one of their rivers for us. You have heard of the Battle of the Sammy, but I don't suppose you have. They have been learning us a lot about gas at attacks lately. They're not the kind your father has. These are more like the open places on the street in 6th Avenue. Only in the army when anything like this happens they give you a gas mask. A gas mask is like a cracked ice bag with windows in it. And in the front they got a cigarette holder. I always heard how the French was cigarette fiends. I guess they got it so bad they put it in the holders so they could smoke during a gas attack. I'm going to put on my mask and have my picture taken and cabinet. That's nothing to do with furniture, Mabel. It's the French for what it's going to look like when it's done. The gas fellow said the other day that gas was perfectly safe because you could always tell when it was coming. You could hear it escape or see it or smell it. The only trouble was, he said, that when the gas started, the machine guns made so much noise you couldn't hear it, and it always came at night so you couldn't see it, and when you smelled it, it was most late to bother anyhow. I've been thinking that over. Seems to me there's a joker in the contract somewhere. Ask your father to read it over and see if it sounds droit. That's French for right. To him. Better still, ask Higgins the grocer to give it the once over. He's got a grand tete, as the French say when they mean brains. It's getting frappier and frappier down here, meaning colder and colder. It got so cold that I put on those socks that you knitted me. I guess I won't any more, though. I guess my feet are going to look like corduroy the rest of my life. You'll understand no hard feeling, I know. You know how delicate my feet is and how I can't afford to print as a hazard with them. Thank your mother for the flannel pajamas. I wear them every night over my uniform. I got to quit now and read some picture postcards that some girls sent me. Good night. Or, as the French say, robe de noite. End of section two.
Section four of Dear Mabel This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Dear Mabel by Edward Streeter. Section four Mon Croquet That's not the kind with the evening dress toothpick in the top, Mabel. A croquet is a French society woman. Study these letters of mine and see how I use the words. You ought to be able to pick up enough French to understand me talking it when I come home. Well, Mabel, New Year's are behind us again. Once more I made a lot of revolutions. It's no use saying there wasn't nothing for me to change. You're prejudiced. I can see faults where others can't. Underneath a pleasant exterior I am made of sterner stuff, as the poets say. I have gave up frivolity with the exception of going into town once in a while to take a bath. I'm strong for this sanity stuff under any conditions. I'm making a study of war. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm working on a plan to end the war. I got thinking, as I will, and it struck me that no one had gone into this at all. They're all figuring how to go on with it, but none of them how to quit it. Don't say nothing till I get it worked out. I guess you always knew you'd hear from me when I got going, eh, Mabel? I also resolve not to put off till tomorrow what I can do today old motto. For instance, if I can get out of a fatigue today, what's the use of waiting till tomorrow? The same with sleeping and resting. I cut out cigarettes, too. I was getting to be a fiend. Got so I had to light one whenever I got thinking. I was using up most a package a day. Nervous and high strung. That's me all over, Mabel. I smoke cigars and a pipe instead. A fellow with an active mind has got to have something. You remember what the fellow what trained the high school show said when he saw me act? Temperature. That's me. Of course, it's harder to borrow pipe tobacco and cigars, but I'm trying to show the fellows how bad cigarettes is. Pretty soon I'll be all okay again. I got that watch your father sent me for a New Year's present. Tell him thanks very much and not to feel bad because he forgot to send me a Christmas present because this wipes out the debt entirely. He said it was a military watch and the latest thing out. I guess they call it a military watch because it works two hours and stops four. It's the latest thing around here. If I answered call by that watch, I'd be falling in for a retreat around taps. It's so slow it can't stop quick. I got the blacksmith over at the headquarters company working on it now. He's an awful good man. He was a plumber in civilian life. That's why they made him a blacksmith when he joined the army. He says he's going to fix it so as I'll never be bothered with it again. I got asked to a dinner New Year's night. I sat next to a colonel's wife. It was kind of embarrassing at first. I put her easy, though. I says, who's that funny-looking old bird sitting across the room with a head like an egg? He's very chick, isn't he? That's a French joke, Mabel. She says, that's my husband. As soon as I'd stopped laughing, I started right in and told her the history of every man in the company, beginning with the A's. You know me when I get started. I didn't give her no chance to get embarrassed. When she started to say something, I just kept right on talking to show her that being a colonel's wife, she wasn't expected to make no effort. I made good, Mabel. I guess you know I would. After dinner, I heard her ask somebody who invited me, and she said something like, He'd ought to be known better. Never miss a chance. That's me all over. It may mean promotion or anything. It may be that she'll have me sent to Fort Silly to learn something. You can't tell. I can't think of anything more that you would understand. Don't show these letters to no one. There is too many spies around. I suppose you are awful lonesome without me. I don't get much time to be lonesome what with drilling and going out somewhere. As soon as things get shook down a bit, I hope to get more time to miss you. How's your father's liver? Au revoir, Bill. Mon ami. Sounds like a scouring powder, doesn't it, Mabel? As a matter of fact, it's the way a French lady talks to a fellow she's awful fond of. I'm not an officer any more. I was just going to resign anyways. The captain's been watching me rise, and he didn't like it. He knew I knew more than him as well as me. Always asking me questions. I'd always tell him because I knew he had a wife and children in Jersey City, and so I was sorry for him. Soft. That's me all over. But the other day, when I was on guard, he said, Corporal, what's the general orders? And I says, Captain, if you don't know them now, you never will, and I wouldn't be doing no service to my country if I told you. Cold but civil, Mabel. 
You know how I can be. The captain just felt cheap and walked away. I kind of felt sorry for him. I almost told him so once or twice. Then I went on guard again. I go on guard a lot. The men like me to be corporal of the guard because when the relief goes out I take all of their blankets and go right to sleep instead of standing outside and watching them freeze. Men hate to be watched while they are freezing. But I happened to be outside for some reason going to dinner, I guess, and I saw the colonel coming. I says, turn out the guard. No one really turns them out, Mabel. They come out themselves. The colonel sees who it is and waves and says, never mind the guard, corporal. So I thanks him and he goes back to the company and goes to bed. As soon as the captain sees that the colonel is saving me up for over there, he gets sore. His plan has been to kill me before we left here. He said he was going to reduce me. That's not the same way your father reduces when he cuts out beer with his meals and sits in a Turkish all day. I never said you will or you won't. Just waited till he got outside and thumbed my nose at him. High spirited. That's me all over. An English officer came over the other day and told us all about the war. He didn't quite finish it cause he only had three quarters of an hour. They was quite a few things I didn't know even at that. He said that the heavy artillery was commanded by the CCODA, and the light artillery by the COA. And there's a special NCO who has nothing to do but look after the SAA. Just imagine, Mabel. I wish I'd studied chemistry more when I was in school. It would make things a lot easier for me now. Then he said that a man always got into his OO to observe the action of the 75s. These English are always great for dress and that formal stuff. I'm glad they're telling us this before we go over. It would have been awful embarrassing to have tried to observe the action of the 75s in my BVDs. I asked him if they had any trouble with the BPOEs. When he left, he said, Cheerio. Without winking a hair, I says, Bevo. Same old Bill, eh, Mabel? They said the other day that my name was on a list to go in school and learn all about Lysen. I said there wasn't much use in their doing that, cause I was pretty well up on that stuff. At home, I says, I had a reputation for a devil with a woman. Nobody knows better than you, eh, Mabel? I guess that's a little over your head, though, Mabel. I try to be as simple as I can. If I'm not, just tell me. I'm writing this letter with my shoes off. I hope you'll excuse my being so informal, but I'm having the old trouble with my feet. they never been right since that winter I taught you to dance. I went to the doctor with them, and he said to keep off in them as much as I could. So they put me to work scrubbing the mess shack on my hands and knees. I bet if a fellow had both legs shot off, they'd prop you up against the wall and put you peeling onions. I got to quit now. They got a thing they call retreat they have every night. I always like to be there just to show the captain I'm behind him regardless. I'm sending you my picture in a uniform pointing to an American flag. It's kind of symbolical, the man said, if you know what that is. I thought you'd like to put it on the mantle in a conspicuous place so as to have something to be proud of when your girlfriend comes in to talk. I'd ask you for your picture, only I haven't got much room for that kind of thing down here. Yours exclusively, Bill. Dear Mabel, everyone round here is going to school now so they can be specialists. Not the kind your mother goes to, Mabel. A specialist only does one thing. I've been doing everything round here ever since I came. I was getting sick of it. I went to the top sergeant and says I guess I'd like to be a specialist too. He said all right, he'd make me a food specialist. Said I'd have to go into it pretty deep. I've been into it up to my elbows in the kitchen ever since. Never trust sergeants least of all top sergeants. If it keeps on like this, there won't be nobody to do the actual fighting but me, Mabel. It's too much responsibility for one man. Suppose I was to get sick or something. And then a bunch of fellows went away to learn to be officers. That kind of struck my fancy at being about the only thing I had it done around here. I went to the captain and told him I thought I'd like to go. He said I could go, and then he added something. He said a company was built up something like a man. There was the brain, which was the officers, and then some was the muscle, and some was the bone. He said I seemed to be pretty well fitted for my part by nature, so he wouldn't change me. I've always been strong ever since I was a kid, Mabel. I've wrote a poem. I sent it to the division paper. They wouldn't print it because they said it was so real that it might depress the men. 
I guessed it was right, cause I read it to the fellows in the tent and it seemed to depress them awful. I'm writing it to you. It's about the war. You'll probably notice that yourself if you read it careful. Here it is. Hear the thunder of the guns smashing down the German Huns, and the sticky pools of gory blood soaking up the oozy sod, the rushing, roaring, shrieking boom of bullets crashing through the gloom. Listen to those great bumps bust on the quivering Hunnish crust. Listen to the shrieking, moaning, swearing, yelling, grunting, groaning that comes to us across the trenches all mixed up with gruesome stenches. Biff and from their hellish lair the shrieks of Germans rent the air. Bloody limbs lie on the ground, bits of Hun go flying round. Bang! And through the cannon's roar is plainly heard the splashing gore. But this cannot go on for long, cause Uncle Sam is coming strong, and when we charge the German line, we'll chuck the damn thing in the Rhine. And blood and slaughter, rape and gore, and Belle la French will reign no more. Ain't that terrible, Mabel? I read it to one fellow, and he said it made him absolutely sick. He said he didn't see how I could write it without getting sick myself. Just between me and you, Mabel, I did come pretty near being once or twice when I was writing it. Most of that's all confidential, but I don't care if you read it to some of your friends just to give them a good idea of what war is. Some of the things ain't very nice, of course. If you're writing big stuff, though, you got to put in everything that comes into your head, or else you lose the punch. I think the end's the best. A lot of fellows have said that. We ought to have more of that. It gets the slackers. The Rhine is a German river where they make wine near Berlin, Mabel. You keep mentioning a fellow named Brogant in your letters. Now I ain't got a spark of jealousy in my nature. Big. That's me all over, Mabel. But I warn you frankly, if I ever catch one of these ailing enemies winding up your Victrola, I'll kick em out of the house. That's only fair. It isn't that I care a snap. There's plenty of girls waiting for me. It's just the principle of the thing. Don't think for a minute that I care. I just mentioned it because I couldn't think of nothing else to say. Yours till you hear otherwise. Bill. End of section 4《Section 5 of Dear Mabel》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Dear Mabel》by Edward Streeter《Section 5 Pom di mon oi You say that like oi oi in Yiddish. It means apple of my eye. I never saw an apple in nobody's eye, Mabel, but I guess that's some French custom. Great news, Mabel. A fellow what's got a friend in the audience department in Washington just told me the war's going to end about the 15th of February. Don't say nothing to nobody about it. It might look as if I was getting mixed up in politics. I put in for a furlough on the 5th, though. Then I won't have to come back, eh, Mabel? I'll bet you're glad. It's great to think of getting to a place where you can't see through the walls and there ain't three inches of mud on the floor. And think of not having to tie the doors together when you come in or crawl underneath them on your hands and knees and not having to put everything you own in the world under the bed. But I guess you don't care as much about these things as I will. This would be a good training camp for Arctic explorers. I bet the fellow that picks out the camps either owns a cold storage plant in civil life or else they do it by mail order. It got so cold the other night the silver in the thermometer disappeared. It ain't been seen since. We got a comical guy in the tent, Bill Huggins. Me and him's a pair. Keep everybody laughing all the time. Bill likes things hot about as well as me. Every night he fills a Sibley stove so full of wood that he has to hammer the last piece in. It gets so hot that it jumps up and down like a mad monkey. That's the way Sibleys do when they get awful hot. We're not bothered by that much, though. We got another guy that's a fresh air fiend. His name is Angus McKenzie. He's Scotch. He's so close himself that he has to have lots of air or he'd smother. Every night he pulls up the side of the tent by his bed. No one likes fresh air in its place better than me, Mabel. But when it's as fresh as this air is, its place is outside. I wake up in the night rolled into a ball like a porcupine. There's things in the middle of my back like his stickers. If I don't move, I get cramps. If I do, I freeze. All around the place where I'm laying is as warm as a park bench in winter. Sometimes I forget and push my feet down. That's awful. One night I thought I heard the horn and stuck my head out of the blankets. It was Angus with his head and one arm outside snoring. Can you beat that? I bet he swims in the ice all winter, home, 
and has his picture in the Sunday paper. I froze my ear before I could get my head back. That's the kind of fellow he is. It's awful cold in the morning. They blow three calls. The first is just for the slow guys. I can make it nice from the march if I don't take too many clothes off. That's no temptation. One guy jumps up just before assembly and makes a lot of fuss like he's getting dressed. He don't fool nobody. The only thing he takes off at night is his hat. Some say that falls off when he gets into bed. Angus gets up every morning in his BVDs. I think his skin is fur-lined. You can hear him smashing the ice in the pail with a hairbrush outside. Then you can tell he's washing by the noise he makes like a busted steam pipe. Then he comes smashing into the tent, leaving the door open, wipes the ice off in his face with somebody else's towel, and says, Gosh, that's great. I hate that kind of fellow. Bill Huggins cleaned the stove with his towel last week so as everything would be neat for inspection. Angus got hold of it in the dark next morning. Gee, you'd have to laugh, Mabel. I got the little tin mirror you sent, Mabel. It's unbreakable, all right. Bill Huggins got so mad at it he tried to break it and couldn't. The first time I looked in I got an awful start. I thought I was starving. I looked like one of them pictures of hungry Indians that the missionaries show you just before they pass the plate. Bill Huggins swiped it later and says why didn't somebody tell him he was getting so fat because he couldn't go home on a furlough like that. He didn't eat nothing for three meals and he looked at himself with the mirror turned the other way. It's like one of those Coney Island places where a fellow can go in and laugh at himself for a dime. Next time send me one that will break. I got to quit now and buy a couple of pies before I go to bed. I don't sleep good unless I have a little something in my stomach. Don't say nothing about what I told you in the beginning. Until the 15th of February, then. Yours faithfully, Bill. Dear Mabel, The captain ain't going to give me my furlough. Says there's an order out against it. Someone's got it in for me, Mabel. I bought a woolly coat awful cheap from Bill Huggins. Right away there's an order against him. Angus McKenzie sold me a pair of leather leggings for less than he paid for them. Some bargain from Angus. The next day they issue an order that you can't wear them. Now they hear I want to go home and put out an order out against it. If they'd only come right out and say, Bill Smith, we're going to get you. Sneaky. That's what I call it, Mabel. I've half a mind to transfer back to the artillery. If I transfer much, they'll be charging me extra fare, eh, Mabel? Only for me and the captain not being able to agree, I'd never have left. I understand he's been awful sorry since. All you have to do with artillery is to put a bullet in the gun. It does the rest. In the infantry, you got to go up and do all the dirty work yourself. Besides, I'm getting leery of these infantry fellows. They're always talking about what we're going to do to the Germans, blowing them to pieces and slicing them up and throwing them all around the lot. I got thinking, what if the Germans was learning their men to do the same thing? They never seem to figure on these things. And the bayonets, Mabel. They ain't safe. When you get a lot of fellows in a trench with their bayonets sticking every which way, someone's going to get hurt, sure. I got those cigars your father sent me. Thank him and tell him if he ever gets taken like that again not to send such a large box. But, well, you explain it to him, Mabel. You can do that sort of thing much better than I can. Outspoken. That's me all over, Mabel. Why is it that no matter how fussy a fellow was when he wore a vest, as soon as he begins to call a coat a blouse, no one thinks he knows what's what? If you got any old magazines what was old before the war started, send them to the soldiers. They won't know the difference. Some woman sent our regiment the Baptist Review for three years back. That ain't right, Mabel. They'd give you candy that comes by the bale. Then they come around and watch you eat it. I bet if you walked into their place and watched them eat, they'd raise an awful holler. They make speeches to you that you'd get your money back without asking up north. They give you free movies that's so old they look as if they was taken in the rain. It seems like feeding the hippo at the zoo, Mabel. It don't matter so much as long as there's lots of it. I'm going into town tonight with a bunch to eat a swell dinner on a china plate. All but Angus McKenzie. He eats all his dinners on me. I'm awful sick of eating out of a tin frying pan. When you put the food in it, it folds up like a jackknife going the wrong way. It takes months to make a good mess kid eater. We get our mess from some fellows what stands behind a counter. One of them divides the coffee. He does it by putting half in your cup and half on your thumb. The other fellow has big spoons. I guess they are old lacrosse players. A big wad of food hits your plate, splash, and knocks it squeegee. The other fellow hits the plate and knocks it the other way. 
When you get it all, it's running out of one dish up your sleeve and out of the other back into the food pans. Army food always runs. Cooks love loose scrub. They're awful stupid. If there's anything solid, you get it in the pan with the rim on it. Then they pour the soup on your cover. When you sit down, half of what you got left spills out on the table. It isn't so bad now because everything freezes about as soon as it hits. You ought to see us eat breakfast, Mabel. We got so many overcoats and things on that a fellow don't get no elbow action. Some fellows eats with their wool gloves. That ain't a good scheme, though. It makes things taste like eatin' peaches with their skins on. The fellow that invented our eating tables must have been a supply sergeant once. All the seats is nailed to the table. When you get a spoonful of loose food up, some fellow puts his foot in your lap and leaves a couple pounds of mud there. I just brush it off, though, on the next fellow. Never complain. That's me all over. Well, Mabel, I've got to shine my shoes now and go eat off in china plates with a nigger waiter. I don't eat with a nigger waiter, Mabel. It's awful hard to explain things to you sometimes. So now I will close. Hoping you are the same, Bill. Dear Mabel, I've been thinking of you a lot during the last week, Mabel, having nothing else to do. I've been in a hospital with bronchitis. I guess I caught it from Joe Loomis. He comes from there. I'd have wrote you in bed, but I dropped my fountain pen on the floor and bent it. I'm all right now. I got some good news for you, Mabel. The cook says we only drew ten days' supply of food last time. He says he guesses when we ate that up, we'll go to France. He's an awful smart fellow, the cook. He's got a bet on that if the alleys don't buck up and win, the Germans is coming out ahead. Max Glucose, a fellow in the tent, is referee. We're eating as fast as we can. Perhaps we can eat it all in less than ten days. So maybe we'll be gone, Mabel, before I write you from here again. There's a French sergeant comes round once in a while and says the war's going to be over quick. He ought to know, because he's been over there and seen the whole thing. He smokes cigarettes something awful and don't say much. It's because the poor cuss can't talk much English. It must be awful not to talk English. Think of not being able to say nothing all your life without waving your arms around and then looking it up in a dictionary. I feel so sorry for those fellows that I'm studying French a lot harder so as they'll have something to talk to when we get over there. I'm reading a book now that's wrote all in French. No English in it anywhere, Mabel. A fellow told me that was the only way to talk it good. I don't understand it very well so far. The only way I know it's French is by the pictures. Some day I'm going to find out what the name is. Then I'm going to get the English of it. Those are some pictures. Ain't I fierce, Mabel? I guess that's why I get on with women so well. I gave up reading it out loud because the fellow said it made them think they was in Paris so as much they got restless. I can't speak no better yet. I guess that comes all at once at the end of the book. As soon as we got the hot showers all fixed up, the pipes busted. So the other day the captain walked us all into town to take a bath. I didn't need one much. I used my head more than most of them. Last fall when it was warm I took as many as two a week and got away ahead of the game. I went along though. More for the walk than anything. I saw the captain didn't make no mood to take a bath himself. I thought he might be shy. He don't mix very well with the fellows. I felt sorry for him. Everyone else was laughing and throwing things with him standing off and none throwing a thing at him. I went up and says, Ain't you going to take a bath this winter too, Captain? Just jolly, Mabel. That all. I says, You don't want to mind the butch. They don't care a bit. They're as dirty as you are anyway. Probably more. And I bet they were, Mabel, because I ain't seen the captain do a stroke of work since we came here. He just stands around giving orders. I says, if none won't lend you a towel, you can use mine. I was going to have it washed anyway. He got awful red and embarrassed, Mabel. I thought he was going to choke. He's awful queer. Just like the other morning, he calls me over and says, Smith, my orderly's sick. You can shine my boots this morning. He said it like I'd been begging him to for a month. And then he says, Smith, you can light the fire in my stove. He had me thinking he was doing me favors. He said I might put some oil on his boots if I wished. I says, that would be a great treat, and I wish he wouldn't be so kind or the fellows would think he's playing favorites. I guess he didn't hear me, Mabel, because he'd just gone out. I said it anyway. I didn't care if he was there. Spunky, that's me all over. I couldn't find no oil for his boots anyway, Mabel, so I poured some out of his lamp. And then I don't think that suited him. Queer fellow, the captain. I keep hearing more about this fellow Broggins. I suppose he belongs to the home guards and wears his uniforms around in the evening. I suppose he has an American flag on his writing paper. It don't mean nothing in my life. 
I ain't gonna put up no arguments or get nasty like most fellows would. Dignity. That's me all over, Mabel. Let me tell you, though, if I ever come home and find him shining his elbows on the top of your baby grand, I'll kick him down the front steps if I only have one leg to do it with. I'm writing this in the YMCA in the afternoon because I'm going on guard tonight. I don't see why they don't make it a permanent detail and be done with it. Someone said the top sergeant's a man of one idea. I guess I'm the idea. I didn't go out to drill this afternoon. I didn't say nothing to the sergeant, though, because sergeants have an idea that if they don't get a lot of fellows to go out to drill with them, they don't look popular. I got to go new so as to get in my tent before they come from drill. As ever on guard, Bill. End of section 5《セクション6 of Dear Mabel》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dear Mabel by Edward Streeter《セクション6》Dear Mabel, I would have wrote sooner, but I've had such a cold I couldn't say nothing for most a week. Well, Mabel, we ate all the food like the cook said, but we ain't in France yet. I guess he ain't got as many brains as he said he had. Everyone is sore at him cause we didn't kick at none of his food for more than a week thinking that when we'd ate it all we'd go away. He thinks it's funny and says, Do you guys think this war is a coax tour? I hate fellows what tries to get out of things by being smart. Everything's covered with mud including me. I seem to attract mud like I was a maggot, Mabel. Yesterday I spent all the afternoon shining up for the guard so as to be the colonel's orderly. Then I step out of the tent and flewy. The sergeant says, Smith, don't you know enough not to go on guard looking like that? I even got mud in my hair. Max Luco says when he combs his, it's like raking out a garden. From what I've seen of him, though, I don't see how he found out. It's pouring rain and awful cold. It's so cold that the toothpaste rolls right off in your brush in the morning. The captain has a cold in his nose. He says he won't take the men out in such bad weather as today. Tain't nothing against him, Mabel, but I hope he has a cold all winter. There's a hole in the tent over my cot where the water comes through on me. I put a slicker over me last night. The water made puddles in it. Then when I turned over, they spilt out into my shoes. This had me guessing, Mabel, till finally I put on Max Glucose's shoes there instead of mine. Angus McKenzie had so many holes over his cot that it looked like one of those safety fire sprinklers. He got up last night and rigged his shelter so as half the water hit it and run down into the next cot. He's a bright fellow, Angus, even if he is a foreigner. The other day he had some medicine for a cold. It says on the bottle that I was 17% alcohol. He drank the whole thing right down so as nobody couldn't get a hold of him. It made him awful sick, but he says that's because he isn't used to it for such a long time. Me and him's going down next week to put in a stock of tonics. It's awful hard to write letters, Mabel. Somebody's always falling over your feet or dragging something wet over the paper if you've got a cot near the door like mine is. And when you get going finally at about the fourth try, some sergeant always comes in with a list and makes you check up something. Sometimes I go over to the YMCA, Mabel. But as soon as you get right and a bald-headed fellow jumps up and says, Now, fellows, we'll all sing. All the fellows watch right and looks up and says, Ah, one thing and another. I don't know who the bald-headed fellow is. They got one in every YMCA. They all look about alike. I guess there's a regular issue. There's always a bunch of fellows what don't seem to know why they came, and they all start singing. Then I can't write no more or do nothing. So I come home and go to bed. Independent. That's me all over, Mabel. Most of the taxis are swallowed up in the mud. There's only two or three running now. Only the big, strong fellows can get to town. The cook says it's the old theory of the arrival of the fittest. But I guess you don't know nothing about science, Mabel. When I go to town, I wrap my blouse in a newspaper. If they know you're going, they give you a list of things to get that looks like a Chinese message to Congress. By the time you go to come home, you got so many bundles you look like one of those fellows in the funny papers. Everyone stands in the square looking for a hat rack waiting for the three taxis to come along. When they see one, they rush it like they do in the movies when the millionaire's cars run over the poor fellow's kid. If going over the top is any worse than getting under the top of one of them things with fifty bundles and as many fellows, then Sherman didn't know many swear words, eh, Mabel? But that's history, and I guess you wouldn't understand. And then when you get home without a bath or a haircut or the movies or nothing, and you forget to get that shaving soap for yourself and spend all your money, they say, Thanks, Bill. Put it over here. Can you change a ten-dollar bill? There ought to be a law against making money in such big numbers. 
I'm glad you've taken up singing lessons again. You ought to take a lot of them. I got a favor to ask. I don't do that often. Proud. That's me all over. But if that fellow Broggins keeps buttin' around sing for him, Mabel. It ain't askin' much with me down here defendin' you, although I don't see why I had to come down here to do it. Yours internally, Bill. Dear Mabel, this is the last time I will ever take my pan in hand for you. All is over among us. I felt it coming for some time, Mabel. Today I'm on some letters that I got from girls with one from a girl what knows you well. She told me all about this fellow Broggins. She says you take him around with you everywhere. That's the kind of fellow I thought he was, Mabel, but I'm surprised at you. She says you're awful fond of him and he's so cute. I ain't cute and ain't never pretended to be. A man's man. That's me all over, Mabel. She says she went up to your house the other night and he was sitting in your lap sticking his tongue out at my picture on the mantelpiece. After that, Mabel, there's nothing to say. So I repeat, all is over among us. I'm returning today by Parcel's Post, the red sweater and the gloves that has no fingers and the socks that you wear over your head in your picture. Most of the stuff ain't been used much. The picture has some mud on it because I had to keep it in the bottom of my barrack bag and my shoes came next. The socks I can't send back because I sold them to Joe Glucose and you wouldn't want them now. The stuff that you sent me to eat I haven't kept. I guess you wouldn't want that anyway, Mabel. The stuff that your mother sent me I'm going to keep. She wasn't my girl and she didn't have to send all that stuff if she didn't want to. As for all the things I've given you, Mabel, keep them. I don't want them no more. I ain't even going to mention all the money I've spent on you for movies and sodas and the Lord knows what not. I ain't the kind of fellow to throw that up to a fellow or even mention it in no ways. I kept track of it, though, in a little book. It comes with $28.27 and some odd cents. And I ain't a-going to hold it up against you that I've been saving in the bank for most two years so as to have a little something toward that house with the green blinds. And then I got something like $87.22 in the bank, if you can believe what that eagle beak in the cage writes in your book. All wasted, you might say, when you think of the fun I might have had with it in the last two years. Those scenes will just forget. You seem to have already. In that season's pass I got for you for the happy hour so you could keep in touch with things while I was away. Keep that and take Broggins. Otherwise, I got a hunch you ain't going to the movies as much as you used to. I guess this will hit your father and mother pretty hard. They got nobody to blame but yourself. On the other hand, it's going to please some girls that I know. So it's a poor wind that don't blow nobody round, as the poets say. I guess you won't hear much about the poets anymore, Mabel. All you'll hear about is Broggins. I hate a man what talks about himself. I suppose he has joined the home defense. Are you going to have a military wedding, Mabel? I'm kind of sorry for your father. If you have his liver on your hands, don't blame me. You know the doctor said any kind of shock would set him off a mile. And now, Mabel, I'm closing for the last time. It won't be no use running to the door when you hear the postman no more, because he won't have nothing but the gas bill. From now on, the only way you'll hear from me is in the papers, perhaps when we get over there. Now I'm going to ask you a favor, Mabel, for old time's sake. Take the picture I had taken pointing to the American flag and burn it up. You can't have that to show your friends no more, and I ain't going to have no flat foot making faces at it. I may be selfish, Mabel, but a girl can't make a cake and eat it too, as the old saying is. Give my best to your father and mother. Tell them I sympathize with them in their loss. It's no use writing any more, because I'm firm as the rock of Gibber Altar. Concrete. That's me all over, Mabel. As ever, yours no longer. Bill. Western Union Telegram, received at Philopolis, New York. Miss Mabel Gimp, 106 Main Street, Philopolis, New York. Dear Mabel, how was I to know Broggins was a dog? You can send back all your stuff and make me some more if you want to. This telegram is costing me nine cents a word, so I can't say no more. Thrifty, that's me all over, Mabel. Bill. End of Section 6 End of Dear Mabel by Edward Streeter